Thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is Domain Modeling Made Functional. And um, hopefully you haven't seen this before, otherwise you'll know the answer to all these questions. But before we get started, I just actually have a, um, a little challenge for you, which is here's some code. This is F sharp code, which is what I'll be using. Um, the code really doesn't matter, but this is some sort of record type. And there's these fields, and there's an email address. And there's this flag called is email verified, which must be true if you have proved that you own the email by clicking a link in an email. You know. So if you saw this code in a code review, would you be happy with it or would you want to change it? And if you would want to change it, why would you want to change it? It's using primitive types, good. Any other? Yeah, the state is it's hard to understand. You're using a Boolean to represent something much more complex and it's hard to make. Yeah, so I mean I but to be honest, I probably would have been fine with this a few years ago. But I've sort of evolved my thinking about this kind of design and I'm going to try and explain in this talk, I'm going to try and explain um why you know how I've evolved and, and why you might want to think about changing stuff <clears throat> So domain modeling made functional. Uh, my name's Scott Voloshin, I have a Twitter handle, and I have f -sharp for fun and profit .com. Um I'm going to be using f -sharp for all these examples, but this is not really about f -sharp per se, it's about domain modeling. So there's a whole functional programming people, there's a whole group of domain-driven design people, and I'm right in the intersection, and currently this is a very small intersection because the functional programming people tend to be quite mathematical and they don't care about domain of design, and the domain of design people tend not to be into functional programming. So you know, hopefully this talk will persuade you that these things actually can go together really, really well. Uh, people think the functional programming you know, is good for mathematics and parallel processing and that you have to have a PhD in computer science to understand it, but I'm here to tell you that functional programming is really good for boring line of business applications. Blobbers, I call these blobbers. And you know, this is things like accounting, inventory management, e-commerce, boring stuff. Basically the stuff that most businesses do. And most, probably most of you, and certainly what I used to do is this is your day job, this is what you get your, make your living doing. And I think functional programming is actually really good for this stuff. It's not, it's not just good for fancy stuff, it's good for boring stuff. <clears throat> so I'm going to try and persuade you that functional programming and domain of design can actually get on together. They can actually be friends. So there you go. Right. So let's talk about design. I'm just going to tell you my take on why design is important. Um, so just like any process, the software, de software development is a process. There's an input and you do something and there's an output. And we love to talk about the process. We love to talk about coding and testing and what's the best compiler and what's the best editor and Vi versus Vim versus Emacs and you know TDD versus BDD versus like we love to talk about all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> but if you if you remember the thing, you know, garbage in, garbage out. That means if you have bad input, you will have bad output. So if you can reduce the garbage coming in, then hopefully you can have reduced the garbage coming out. If you have bad garbage coming in, the best compiler, the best editor, the best toolkit, the best development processes will not help you. You will still end up delivering something bad. So the idea of trying to reduce the garbage coming in, I call that design. Okay, and it's just a general word for just trying to understand what's going on before you start building it. So how do we do design right? I think that's why we're all here at this conference to try and figure this out. So there's two parts. The first thing I'm going to take from the agile contribution is getting rapid feedback and you know doing something and learning from it as fast as possible. Don't just take six months to deliver something. Try and deliver something in two weeks or one week or a few days. And then from DDD, um, I like to think of domain-driven designers actually trying to create a shared mental model that everyone is on the same page, everyone is thinking the same way, everyone is using the same words. And that shared mental model is also in the code. It's not just in people's heads. So here's a little picture of the shared mental model and we have
experts, domain experts, subject matter experts, they're sometimes called. We have product people, we have developers, we have customers, users, whatever you want to call them, stakeholders, everybody. Everyone involved should be sharing the same mental model. So that's my version of domain-driven design. They're all using the same language, the same concepts. And in particular, like I said, the code is part of this. And the, the, the domain model and the code and the documentation all try to be the same thing. Okay? And the common language is in the code as well, not just in people's heads. So when I talk to non-developers, or even developers, and they say, can you really have the code represent the domain? This is what people think code looks like, especially non-developers. <laughs> You know, and it's like, yeah, this does not, res you know, this does not re represent anything useful, right? This is so the kind of thing I'm talking about. This is the kind of code I'm going to show you. The kind of code that I think you should be writing. So you have to try and guess what domain this is, okay? So if you can win points by trying to, you know, figure it out, right? So yes, here we have our game, and hopefully you guess that it's something to do with a card game. And there's something called a suit, and there's something called a rank, and there's something called a card, and there's something called a player. Now, what's interesting is, I imagine that most of you don't know F-sharp. This is F-sharp code. And even though you don't know F-sharp, you can probably understand this code, because this is about the concepts. So we have our shared language down the side, right? And the way I explain this to non-developers, because I want non-developers to read this code, <coughs> not just programmers. You know, the vertical bar is a choice, so it's a club or a diamond or a spade or a heart. Uh, the little star means a pair, so a card is a, is a choice of a, one, pick a suit and then pick a rank. You have a list type. Uh, and then we have this thing with an arrow. So this is, uh, to deal is an action. It's not just a noun, it's a verb, it's something you do. And we're going to represent in F sharp or in functional model, we're going to represent it with this function. So this says deck arrow, deck star card. All right, so what does that mean? So here is our function. So functions have inputs and outputs. And so our deal function, the input is a deck of cards. And after we've dealt a card, there is now a new card on the table. And we have a, a different deck, because in, in functional programming, everything's immutable. So the deck, you don't mutate the original deck. You create a copy of the original deck with that one card missing. So the input is an original deck, and the output is a, a new deck and a card on the table. So we represent that with deck arrow, that's the input, and then the output is a pair, it's a deck and a card. So that's how we represent an action in our model. And let's look at picking up a card. So there's a card on the table, and I have some, a hand, I have my own cards, and I'm going to pick it up. So the input is my hand and the card on the table. And after I've done the pickup, the card on the table is missing, and I have a new hand with a new card in it. So it's a different hand. It's changed. So again, I represent this saying the input is a pair of things, and the output is my new hand. So this is how we model actions, verbs, workflows, use cases, stories, whatever you want to call them. This is how we would model it in functional programming. So here's a question. Do you think this is a reasonable amount of code to write for this domain? I would say yes. Basically, we fit the, in, the whole domain is on one page. It's pretty good. We don't, it's not in 20 different files. You know, it's actually right there in one page. Um, do you think a non-programmer could understand this? And I think yes. In fact, when I've been doing domain modeling exercises with people, when I have everyone in a room, I have programmers in a room, but I also have the domain experts and the subject matter experts and the product owners in the room, and I'm typing all this stuff out, and someone said, well, this is great, but where's the code? Because this, like, this is code, right? Do you think that non-programmers, if I'm typing this up on the screen, do you think that non-programmers could provide useful feedback? For example, there's a deliberate mistake. Anyone see what the mistake is? Ace is missing, right. Now, I, I don't think you have to be a programmer to notice that, right? This is the kind of thing in real, in real life I've had people tell me that I forgot something. I, you know, I, didn't, I missed out one of the choices because, you know, but they can give me that kind of feedback right away. So this thing about rapid feedback is really important. Now, in Agile, the idea is to get feedback 
in weeks, or even better, in days, by having a rapid prototype, by having a minimal via product, by having all these different words, wouldn't it be great if you could get feedback in minutes rather than days? That would be awesome. So this process is great for that, because what you're doing is I, go, I, I, I type all this stuff on the screen, and I'm talking to people and getting in, information, and I type up something like, you know, a deck is a list of cards. And to deal, uh, you start with a deck and, you know, the function I just told you. And the domain expert will probably say, this deck thing, um, you know, that's not quite right. When we deal in a real card game, we don't use a deck, we use a shuffle deck, something called a shuffled deck. And I don't know anything about card games, and so I say, uh, okay, so I can put it down like this, make sure I got the right understanding, and they say, that's good. And then I say, you know, what is a shuffled deck? What is this special thing called a shuffled deck? And they say, it's just a list of cards. So I write this list of cards. Now what's interesting here is that I don't say it's the same thing as a deck because they're both lists of cards. The shuffle deck is a different concept from a normal deck, from an unshuffle deck. It's a different concept in the domain. It's not a normal deck with a Boolean flag saying whether it's been shuffled or not. It's not a, it's not a two subclasses of a base class. Right? A shuffle deck is just a different concept from a normal deck. They might have the same representation. They might both be represented by list of cards, but they're different concepts. Okay, then I'm, I go along and I say, okay, so we've got the shuffle deck thing. How, where do I get one of these shuffle decks? Okay, how do I make a shuffle deck? And the expert says, well, you do a shuffle. Now, when you're talking to the experts, they normally look like, they act, you know, like you're stupid because you're asking all these stupid questions. And you don't know anything, and this is good because you should be asking these questions and learning about the domain. You want to become a, a, a domain expert yourself. So I say, okay, you need to do a shuffle. So you know, you, this is a concept called shuffling, and you start with a normal deck, and you end up with a shuffle deck. So what we've learned, just by typing this stuff down, I've got feedback within minutes. No, I don't have to wait a, a week until we've actually delivered something. I've got feedback from the domain expert straight away. And I've learned something. I personally have learned something new about the domain. So in this, in this idea, you know, we're, we're, using, we're all now using the same language. As a developer, next time I talk to the d domain expert, I will use a word like shuffle deck. It's a new concept I've learned. So, you know. so this is a very, very fast process. And you're basically writing code, but not really. You know, you're, you're learning very fast from the experts in an agile way, but you're not actually writing code. But what's cool is this code, because it's code and it's not a document and it's not a UML diagram, this code can be used as a template for writing your real code. So this is typically the first file uh, in your project, your F# -sharp project. Is like this is the kind of these are the concepts. Now the rest of the code is more complicated, but the, the concepts are very strange. So here's our final piece of code. Now notice it's domain driven, it's not database driven. So there's nothing about foreign keys, there's nothing about tables. Right? It's pure, every, every single word here is something to do with the domain. So this is what's called persistence ignorance in the domain driven design book. Nothing to do with databases. Now obviously at some point you're going to have to put it in a database. That's fine, but that's not part of the domain logic, that's something else, you know but it's not part of this bit here. It's also not object-oriented. There are no base classes, there's no manager classes, there's no factory classes. Everything is domain-driven. So in the real world, you have this vocabulary, you like suit and rank and card and so on. So in the code, you have the same vocabulary. And you know the domain code should always be in sync with the real world. So if you learn something about the real world, like, like we've learned this new thing called a shuffle deck and a new thing called shuffle, we put that in the code. We represent that in the code itself. We don't add a Boolean flag to the deck when we learn that. We actually literally model it as a separate thing. So that's the right way to do it. The wrong way to do it is the other way around. Right? So don't use programmer jargon in your domain. If you say we need some sort of class that manages all the players, or we need a base class, between the deck and a shuffle deck, or we need an abstract card, proxy, factory bean, <laughs> right? So th this kind of jargon should not be in your domain. Now, obviously, in real code, there's complicated bits, you know, but 
that should be in the implementation side, that shouldn't be in the domain side. So don't, if you start doing this, you're doing it wrong. Okay, so one of the agile philosophies is, you know, if you can make the design be in the code, that's great because the code is the source of truth. Documentation goes out of date, UML diagrams go out of date, but um, the code is the design, you know. The code is the source of truth. If you can have the design in the code, that's the best possible solution. So I think this is the, a, a very good answer here. And of course, this is executable code. Like I say, this would typically be the first file in your project, and then the rest of the code will then depend on this. So if you change this, the rest of the code will break until it fixes. So this is the code and the, and the design are always going to be in sync. And it's not just about the result of trying to create this. This is not like an answer. The process is a really important part of this. The idea is trying to get everyone on the same page. When, you do a, when I do these kind of workshops with people, people argue about what is the right word to use. Are we using the same words? And you know, that process of arguing and debating and discussing and, and, and talking, that is a really important part of it. Getting everyone on the same page is, is, the, is the, actually the important part. This is just the output of that. But, but you, know, you don't just do this and then share it with everyone and say, here's the answer. This is kind of a living document that's based on, you're trying to just capture what people are thinking, you're not trying to force it on people. So the process is very, very important. And we'll see this a lot, you know, event storming is all about the process, it's not about the results. You know, context mapping, all this stuff, it's all about getting everyone on the same page and everyone to share their ideas. Okay, so this is a key domain-driven design principle, which is communicate the design in the code. So now if we go back to this, let's look at the problems Right. Um, this, the problem with this is it does not communicate design in the code. That's the main problem with it. So for example, which values are optional? Some values might be optional and some are required. So in this case, the middle initial might be optional, um, but it's not communicated here. You might have some validation logic somewhere that checks it, but that's not communicated. Um, what are the constraints? I mean, can the first name really be a million characters long? I don't know how many you can put in a string, but a lot. Can it be a million characters long? Can it contain non-printable characters? Can it contain line feeds? Can it just be all blank? There's some constraints, right? It's not at all obvious. It just says it's a string. There's no, there's no constraints anywhere. So that's bad. So let's say you're going to put it in a database. You want to have the constraint that it's less than 50 characters and it's not blank. Um, now, you could put that constraint in the validation logic somewhere. But that's not in the domain model, that's somewhere buried in your code. And, and it's very easy for people to bypass validation logic by mistake. If it's actually in the code, it's really hard to bypass. Which fields are linked? Where are the consistency boundaries? You know, some fields can have to be changed as a group and some fields can be changed independently. Um, aggregate roots in domain-driven design terminology, that is not at all clear, right? So for example, these three fields have to be changed as a group, as an atomic unit. And these ones have to be changed as an atomic unit. It's not at all clear from the design. And finally, there's some domain logic here. We have this flag. And when should it be true and when should it be false? So the answer is, go and look it up in the documentation. No, that's the wrong answer. You do not look it up in the documentation because you're going to get it wrong or someone's going to forget and put a, make a mistake. right? So this does not communicate at all what you're supposed to do with this flag. So the rule, the business rule here is, if the email address is reset to a new value, you have to set it to false until it's been verified. Okay, you have to set it to false because otherwise it's a security problem. That is not communicated in this design. Okay, so here's our problems. You know, the main thing is it does not communicate a lot of important design decisions. Okay, so all these four things, and there's probably more, we can fix these with functional domain modeling. And by the end of the talk, you'll see how I fix them. So, now before I show you how to fix them, I need to tell you about functional programming and algebraic types. So algebraic is a mathematical jargon word, and I'm going to use the word composable instead. Composable types, right? So what's a composable type? So in functional programming, the first thing is that types are not classes. They're more like sets. Um, so if you have a function, so let's just go back to the very beginning. What is a function? So a function is something that takes inputs into outputs. So I'm going to use a little railway track analogy. Uh, I'm going to put a little tunnel on it, something, a tunnel of transformation. Something goes into this tunnel, like an apple, and it comes out as a banana. Okay. So this is a function that turns apples into bananas. Okay. So that's everything you need to know about 
functions. You're an expert in functional programming now. OK, so what are types? So here we have this function. What is a type? Well, a type is just a name for a set of things. So all the set of valid inputs, all the set of valid outputs, if you give that a name, that's all the type is. So it's not like a class at all. So for example, if all the possible inputs are integers, we call that integer. All the possible strings, we call that string. Okay? But we could have all the possible people in the world, and we call that person. Uh, we could have all the possible fruit in the world, and we call that fruit. Now, because it's a set, you can have anything in a set, right? Anything can be in a set. So you can have a set of functions. That's a set of things. So this is a type called fruit to fruit functions, functions that turn fruit into fruit. So this is where it gets a little complicated, because in functional programming, you can have functions that have functions as input, and they return other functions as output. So you can have a function that turns the function, which creates another function, which has another function as a parameter. Oh, so that's where it gets complicated. But the basic principles are pretty straightforward. Right, so that's everything you need to know about types. So let's talk about composition. So composition is like Lego, and hopefully everyone knows how to use Lego. Uh, so if you think about Lego, all the pieces are designed to be connected. They all have little bumps on them, right? That's just like the algebraic type system. That's why I call it a composable type system. All the types are designed to fit together. And that is only possible because these types are just sets. And so just like sets, you can do set union and set intersection and cross products and all the stuff. And that's only possible because there's no uh, behavior. Unlike OO, in functional programming, data and behavior are completely separate things. So the data is much easier to manipulate because it's just data and there's no behavior associated. So a composable type system. So how can we compose types in a composable type system? Well, we build new types from smaller types, just like we build bigger things of Lego from smaller things of Lego. And we use AND and we use OR. OK, so what does AND mean? So let's say I want a fruit salad, like one of the lovely fruit salads out there. And I say, well, to make a fruit salad, you need an apple and a banana and a cherry. Now, notice I'm using the word AND, right? So this is something that you get in all programming languages, a pair or a tuple or a record type or a struct or anything. In F sharp, we write like this. This says a fruit salad has an apple field and a banana field and a cherry field. And the apple field has to be an apple kind of apple variety and the banana has to be a banana variety and so on and so forth. So this is, again, if you look, at it, it looks kind of like JSON, right? So everyone's used to this kind of thing. OK. so. Now, the other thing which is different from most other languages is using or. So if I want a snack, I might say I want an apple or a banana or a cherry. And I'm using the word or. Because right, it's the kind of thing you can't get in C sharp or Java. And in F sharp, we use a vertical bar to represent the choices. So it's an apple or a banana or a cherry. Now, if it's an apple, you have to know what kind of apple it is, what variety of apple it is. OK? so when it, in, I call these choice types because they, they're choices. Uh, the technical word for these things is um, sum types or discriminated unions, or there's lots of jargon words. But in, from a domain modeling point of view, I call them choices because it's a choice. So let's look at a real world example of how you build something from a choices. Let's say that you uh, have a payment system and you create a cash check or card. This is kind of an old example because nobody takes checks anymore. But, um, you know, for cash, there's, there's no extra information, it's just cash. For checks, you need a check number. For credit cards, uh, you need a card type and a card number and an expiry date and all the other stuff. So if you had to implement this model, how would you do that? Okay. Now, if you're an OO person, you would probably say, well, let's create a implement, uh, an interface or an abstract base class, like a payment method. and um, then we create a, a subclass or an implementation for each possible choice. So cash is a kind of payment method, check is a kind of payment method, credit card is a kind of payment method, and each of the subclasses uh, has the information they need. So that's the kind of object-oriented version of doing it. Right? I think most people would probably do it this way. So let's look at how you do it in another, a completely different way. So I'm going to do it the other way by building up bigger things from smaller things. So I'm going to start with the smallest thing, which is a check number and a card number. And I'm going to 
I'm not going to use primitive types, just like we said. I'm not going to use them. Because people don't talk about ints and strings. They talk about check numbers and card numbers and uh, payment amounts and stuff, right? So I, I want to immediately define those things using words like that. And then I will have a choice. Maybe a card type is a choice between a Visa and a MasterCard. And the credit card information I need is a card type and a card number. So we have an OR, Visa OR MasterCard, and card type and card number. So I'm using the OR and the AND, right? Two different ways of building up types. And then the payment method, going back to the thing, I say it's cash OR check OR card. And if it's a check, there's some extra information, which is the check number. And if it's a card, there's some extra information, which is the card info. And because I used OR, there's a choice type. But I can keep going. I'm going to say, OK, I've got a thing called a payment amount. And I've got something called a currency, which is euros or dollars. So that's another choice. And say I want a payment. So a payment is an amount and a currency and a payment method. So what I've done, and that's a, so that's a record type. I built up a, you know, using and. So what I've done is I've built bigger types and smaller types using the composition approach. And so this is why composition, I think, is really good. It's really a nice way of doing things. So, you know, if you're used to types in a language like C or C sharp, you normally think of it as a, an annotation for type checking, just to make sure that you can't pass a string into an int by mistake. Something, you know, that kind of thing. It's kind of annoyance. But if you think of it as a domain modeling tool, you know, dealing as a deck and a deck of cards, um, it's a way to capture information about what you're trying to do. But what's cool is if you do this, you get both at once because the, the compiler will type check your domain model. So if you get it wrong, the code won't compile. So having a, trying to do domain modeling using a static type system like this is actually like having a compile time unit test. You do not have to write a unit test for certain things because it literally won't compile if you get it wrong. So that's pretty nice. So static typing is great for domain modeling. Statically type all the things. OK. All right, now let's see what we can do with this type system. So let's start off with the optional values. OK, so here we have our, our contact again. And as I said, the middle initial is optional. How do we represent that? How do we represent optional value? So I'm going to start with a simpler thing. Let's say I'm just taking the length of a string. So I have a function, and the input is the set of all possible strings, and the output is the set of all possible ints. So I say this is a string to int function. There's just one little problem, is that in most languages, null is a valid value for a string. I can say something's a string, and I can give it the value null. And that is bad. That's really, really bad. Okay. Because null is not a string. It's a, it pretends to be a string. If you, if you assign it, it says, yeah, the compiler will say, yeah, null's a string, no worries. When you try and use it, ah, I say, no, 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 not really a string. I'm going to throw a null reference exception. <clears throat> so I like to say that null is like Saruman of static typing, if you know Lord of the Rings. You know, it's treason. He's a traitor. He pretends to be your friend, and he's going to turn around and stab you in the back. Right? So null is a really bad idea. So, OK, we're going to say null is not allowed as a value. Don't ever allow null as a value. So how can we represent missing things, then? Well, if you think about it, we say it's either a string or it's missing. Notice I use the word or. There's a clue, right? So we're going to model it as a choice. It's either a choice between all the strings or nothing. OK? So in, in F sharp, you have to tag these with a, a little flag to, 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 to make them very clear. So we're going to say that's some string and that's nothing. And we're going to write it like this. So optional string is a choice. It's either some string or nothing. And if it's some string, there's some extra data, which is the actual string that it is. So you say, this is just amazing. So optional string is fantastic. And then let's create an optional int. And then let's create an optional boolean. And after a while, you say, hmm, I've got some duplicate code here. Maybe you can make them simpler. So yeah, what we do is we create a generic type option. And that little tick is F sharp's way of saying it's a generic type. So if in C, in C sharp or Java, you wouldn't need it. So this is a type that you can write yourself. Now, in most functional languages, it's built in. But if it wasn't built in, you could define it yourself, because you're not 
defining some special new thing that the compiler needs to understand, you're just using the composable type system as a toolkit for building new types. And this is one of the new types you can build. So algebraic types are very nice. You can do a lot of stuff that you can't really do in traditional languages. OK, so if we go back to this, we just say, instead of saying it's a normal string, we say it's an option of a string with the angle brackets. And one of the nice things in F sharp is you can actually put the option afterwards, so string option, which is a little easier to read for, for non-technical people. So but the same thing. And that's nice and readable. Right, what about simple values and constrained values? So as someone pointed out, we really should avoid primitive obsession. We shouldn't use ints and floats and bools and strings in our domain because that's not what people use in the real world. Okay. Um, I was once at a, I was once doing, when I was younger and I was modeling something and I said, well, this is, is this an integer or is it a float? And they said, is float something to do with water? You know, they did not know what I was talking about, which is fair enough. Why should they? They're not a, they're not a programmer. So don't use the word float. Don't use the word integer. Use payment amount or, you know, product number or whatever it is, right? And on top of that, not only should we not use primitive types, but almost always integers and strings have some sort of constraints. It's very unusual for a string to allow a string to have a million characters in it or to allow an integer. Can you, you know, can you have integers which are four billion? I mean, it's really, maybe, but it's really unusual. Normally there's some sort of constraints on your things. So for example, an email address, you know, it can't be empty. It has to have some sort of pattern matching, like an at sign. If you have customer ID, which is an int, it's probably not any int, it's probably a positive integer, right? So there's some sort of constraint. So email addresses are not strings, customer IDs are not ints. Yeah, I mean, another way to think about it, if you think about an int, like a customer ID, the reason it's not an int is because you can't take the square root of it. Can you add two customer IDs and get another customer ID? You know, can you multiply it by five? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? So they might be represented by ints, but they're not actually ints in the domain. So what we do is we use wrapper types to keep them distinct. And here's two wrapper types. This is the F-sharp way of doing a wrapper type. We just put an email of string, so it's wrapping a string. Custom ID of int is wrapping an int, right? So wrapping a string and wrapping int. So it's very simple, uh, one line to do that. So here's two wrapped types. An email address wraps a string, and a phone number wraps a string. But because we've got wrappers around them, they are now distinct types. And that means you can't ever get an email address mixed up with a phone number. Um, and let's say we have a customer ID and an order ID, and they both wrap, wrap ints in your database. But they're not the same type. They're different types. They can't be mixed up. You should never pass an order ID to somebody that's expecting a customer ID. It just doesn't make any sense. So model them as distinct types always. So you get clear domain modeling, and it also eliminates one kind of bug where you accidentally mix them up, and you pass them in the wrong order or something. OK, so now let's look at how we create one of these things. Let's say I want to create an email address, and I've got a string. Now, if the string contains the at sign, then I'm going to take the string, and I'm going to wrap it up in the email address. That's good. What happens if it doesn't contain the at sign? What should I do? Should I return null? No. Should I throw an exception? No. So what can I do? What can, what can I return? You know, I can't return an email address because it's not a valid email address. Nothing. Nothing. Right. Exactly. So one of the things, if you, if you, throw, if you return null or you would throw an exception or something, if you look at the signature, it says, you give me a string and I'll give you an email address. And that is a lie. That is wrong. So it's a deceptive uh, piece of information. So yes, what I'm going to do is return something or nothing, just like we did with the optional thing. And that's much better. So if you look at the signature, it now says, you give me a string, and I might give you back an email address, maybe, if you give me a good string. So this is now, this is not a lie. This is much clearer. This is better documentation, too. This is now uh, you know, a, a self-documenting code, better than the other one. And we can do the same thing. Let's say we want to have strings that are 50 characters long. So we create a wrapper type for them. And then we create a special constructor for them. And if it's less than 50, that's good. And if it's, more, you know, if it's not, then that's bad. 
And if we look at the signature, it says, you give me a normal string, and I might give you back a string 50 if it's good. So this kind of validation is normally just done at the edges of your program. You know, when you get data coming in from a JSON thing or from a whatever, you have to validate it. But once it's validated, once you've got your string 50 or your email address, it's immutable. So it can never change, which means you never have to validate it ever again. So you never have to do any kind of defensive programming in your core domain code. You never have to check for null. You never have to check that something's valid. Because once it's been validated at the edge, you can pass it around in full confidence that it can never go wrong. So that's one of the nice things about this. OK, here's something which is, which is a problem. Can you really have uh, 999,000 items in your shopping cart or your shopping bars? No. This is probably a bug because the person who wrote this e-commerce site probably used an integer to represent the quantity, right? And you hear stories of you know things overflowing to minus one or minus 32k or something crazy. You know this should never happen. You should never be able to order that many things. So that's because they didn't do domain modeling. So the right answer is to create a type, a wrapper type. Now. To be honest, when I've done e-commerce sites, I have never bothered to do this before because it's a lot of work creating these wrapper types. Um, so, you know, creating a new type just for this domain or just for this little piece of code is not something that people do generally um, because it's like I say, it's a lot of work. But if it's one line of code, it's a lot easier. So if your language makes it easy to do, you'd like to do it much more. Okay, let's look at the constructor. So if it's greater than zero, less than 99, that's good, and if it isn't, it's bad. Then we look at the signature, it says, you give me an integer, and I might or might not give you back an order line quantity. Now, what's interesting about this is that zero is not a valid value. It has to be greater than zero. So when you have the, one of those minus buttons, and you're down you know, two, and you take away one that's one, you take away another one, it goes down to zero, you can't make one of these things. So what that means is that when you're coding your UI uh, or your back end or whatever, you are forced to deal with the case when it goes down to zero. You can't accidentally forget about it. So this is the idea where you know, it, it forces you to think about that situation because you don't actually have a valid quantity at that point. So you, what are you going to do? I don't know. You're probably going to remove it from the shopping cart. But whatever the answer is, you're going to have to think about it. You can't just forget about it you know, and cause a bug. So if we go back to our contacts, here's what we had originally. So the first thing we did is make an option. And then the second thing we did is we created all these constrained types for all these different choices. Right, so all, it's looking better already. Um, the next thing is we need, you know, if you're a domain-driven design person, you'll recognize this is an entity. So we need to add uh, an entity ID. And notice that I'm not, it's not an int, it's something called a customer ID, special to customers, or contact, it really should be a contact ID, I guess. And then here's our two things which really should be separate. Um, well, I can just, uh, rather than having them in one big structure, I can just pull them out into two separate structures. And one of the nice things about having the data separate from the behavior is that this kind of pulling things apart and putting them back together again is really easy to do because um, there's no behavior. So, you know, refactoring is very, very easy. Right, so that's that. Now, what about this last thing here? Where is it? This email verify flag. What are we going to do with that? So, let's talk about getting rid of flags altogether. What we're going to do is replace flags with choices. So, here is our situation. <coughs> We have this flag, and we have some business rules. And it says, if the email is changed, that verified flag has to be set to false. Because who knows? You know, you can set it to anything. And also, if you do want to set it to true, you have to use a special verification service that compares, you know, that checks the email hash and all that other stuff. You can't just set it to true, because that's a security issue. You have to go through this special verification service. So that's a business rule. Can we enforce the business rule in the design without having some logic somewhere? And the answer is yes, we can. So as it stands, anyone can set it to true, 
it's a security problem and it's, it's just bad. It doesn't communicate the, the issue. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create another wrapper type. We're going to wrap an email address and we're going to call it a verified email address. So we have a wrapper around a wrapper. Uh, and this is one of my favorite principles, which is no problem that can't be solved by wrapping it in another type. We're going to see that. So by, by doing this, what we've said is that a verified email address is not the same as a normal email address, right? The whole thing is, is a, it's a distinct type. Just like a shuffle deck is not the same thing as a normal deck. We've created a special concept in the domain. And then we're going to have a verification service. Now, a verific verification service is a function which has two inputs and one output. And the input is an email address and a verification hash of some kind. Um, so you give me the email address, and I'm going to give you back a verified email, maybe, because the hash might not match up or whatever. I mean, there's various reasons it might not work. It's very clear that it might not work sometimes. So you have to deal with that. Okay, so I might give you back a verified email. Okay, so that's the verification function. And then here's the cool bit. We take this contact information and we change it into a choice. We say it's either a choice between an unverified email and a verified email. So the flag has disappeared. Unverified or verified. Now in the unverified case, the information that goes along with it is just a normal email address. So anybody can set it to be unverified. All I need is any old email address. To set it to the verified case, I have to have the verified email. That's the thing I need to have to put it into the verified case. Where do I get one of these verified emails from? I have to get it from the verification service. Right? So the, and it's, I mean, what I typically do is make the constructor private or something so that nobody else can create one of these things except the verification service. But by doing that now, just like the business rule says, I have to get one from the verification service, the only person who can create one of these things. So that's that business rule. I, I have to go through the verification service to get a verified email. So in that, for that case to be true, okay? So by replacing the Boolean with a choice, it's first of all it's clearer, and secondly, I've actually enforced those business rules. I think it's amazing, all right? So to create that case, you have to go have a verified email, and to create the verified email, you have to go through the service. So the business rules are automatically enforced. So this is a really nice way of doing it. So I'm modeling the domain more accurately, and I'm also getting my business rules. Right, so if we go back to our challenge, we started off with one thing. We now have a whole bunch of things. We have an email address and a verified email and a contact information and a personal name and a contact and a verification. We have a whole bunch of things that we didn't have at the beginning. So what's good about this is a lot of the stuff um, that we had at the beginning are now solved. Right? Which values are optional? Well, you have this optional concept. What are the constraints? Well, we have something called a string 50. We have something called an email address. It's not just strings anymore. Which fields are linked? By breaking them into separate groups, it's much more obvious. And is the domain logic clear? Yes, it is. Unlike that Boolean flag, it's crystal clear that there's these things called un unverified and verified. Now, what's also cool about this is that the ubiquitous language, the common language, is evolving along with the design. We started off with one thing, and we have all these new things. But this is not, I wouldn't say this is more complex, because these are actual real words that real people use. They would talk about something called a personal name. They talk about something called verified email and a normal email. These are words in the domain. So we're actually just representing the domain better. We're not making it more complicated. We're actually, if anything, we're making it more clear. And of course, this is compilable code. This is not a UML diagram. Now, the other thing, in, in Eric's book, he talks about refactoring towards deeper insight, which means when you learn something about the domain, often that opens up a whole new way of thinking about certain things that you, didn't really, that you weren't really aware of before. So, for example, we just created this thing called a verified email to solve that particular problem. But once we have this concept called a verified email, you might find all sorts of other uses for it in the domain, right? So this new, often, like I say, you find a new concept, and then you say, well, okay, this rule, we have a business rule that we didn't think about that says you have to send password resets only to verified emails. Now, before, we would have something where we check the flag, and only if it's set to true do we actually do the thing. Again, we could easily make a mistake and forget the business rule. 
But if we, with this new thing called a verified email, we just say, sending a password reset, it needs a verified email. So our, our domain modeling is actually more, it's now self-documenting. To send a password reset, you need a verified email. Okay? <coughs> I don't have to write a unit test for it. I don't have to check any Boolean flags. It's you know, self-documenting, and it's a compile time unit test. All right, one more thing. So let's say that times change, and we add something called an address a postal address to our contact. So we have an email and an address. And we have a new business rule that you have to have, uh, a contact must have an email address or a postal address. They must be one way of contacting you, okay? At least one way of contact. Now, this design as it stands, does it meet that requirement? No. Because as it stands, both, are, both fields are required. Right? Things are always required unless you tell they're optional. Okay, well, I'll make them both optional. Uh, it doesn't work either, right? Because they're both missing. So our problem is, how do we model the facts? That, how do we model this business rule? Well, we could say, well, let them both be missing, and I'll have some special validation logic somewhere that checks if they're both missing and throws an exception. And it's like, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to try and model it in the domain. Can, can we do that? The answer is, yes, of course we can. Right. So... A great phrase is make illegal states unrepresentable. So rather than letting people do something and then having validation logic or, or special code to check that's a bad thing, just don't let it happen in the first place. Okay? So how can we do that? Here's our business rule. So if you think about it, that means you can have an email address or a postal address or both. Right? That's what the business rule is. Now I'm using the word or. There's a clue. Now how am I going to model this? There's three possibilities, okay? Well, I'm gonna model it like this. Email only, or address only, or both. Right, so by modeling it this way, and then I, you know, I stick it in my contact. By modeling it this way, there's only three possibilities. So it's self-documenting. I don't have to have any special code that checks the, the, the fourth case, because there isn't a fourth case. I literally cannot compile the fourth case where they're both missing. I don't have to write a unit test for it. It literally cannot happen. It is not possible for me to write bad code. And it's good if, if I'm a new developer and I'm coming onto your team and I'm trying to understand what are the business rules, I don't have to look at documentation. I don't have to ask somebody what are the business rules for emails or whatever. I can look at the code. The code is really, really explicit. It's kind of ugly. I don't want to say it's beautiful code. <laughs> it's ugly, but it's explicit. You're not going to make a mistake. Right. So there's the idea of in trying to encode the requirements in the type as much as possible. Now, you can't always do that. The rules of poker, for example, you know, like with the card game, you can encode a lot of the stuff. You can't encode everything. But you can encode more than you think. You can get, at least get all the big concepts down and the concept of dealing and picking up cards and, you know, all that stuff. So uh, static types are almost as awesome as this. A cat on a unicorn. Right. So communication is two-way. Um, it's OK to push back. Um, uh, a contact must have an email or a postal address. You might say, well, that's actually really a bad thing because um, uh, that might not be, you know, it's hard to implement. So let's change it to be a contact must have at least one way of being contacted. So that's better. So. Instead of having both things, we'll say you've got one way of being contacted. So here's all the different ways we can contact you. We can contact you by email or address or whatever. And then the th we go back and we say you've got a primary way of being contacted and a secondary way. The primary way is acquired and the secondary way is optional. So this is a better design. Okay, this is a much more common design because you can extend. You say we need to add Facebook, you need to add texting, you need to add Twitter, whatever. You can just extend this with all the different choices. All right, so... To sum up, we've used code to represent the shared mental model. Um, we've shown how designs can evolve. This is really, really important. You don't just want to get it right first time. It's not a big design up front. Designs will evolve. You need to be able to have some way of embracing the change without being scared to make changes. And I think you can see in this approach, it's quite easy to make changes and still be confident um, that, you, you know, that you have a good design. And this refactoring towards deeper insight is really important. So static typing, I think, is very, very good here. If you're trying to do this in Python or Ruby or something, I really wouldn't be as confident about making all these changes.
So composable type systems are awesome. You could see that we got choices rather than inheritance. We used options instead of null. We used wrappers over and over again and wrapping things and more wrappings. And then finally, this think in your head, always try to make illegal states unrepresentable if you can. So if you like this talk, uh, I have this talk on video and I'm going to probably put this one up there at some point. I have more videos. I have a book. If anyone has the book and they want me to deface it, I'll be quite happy to do that. And contact me on Twitter if you've got any questions. And if you like this one, stay for the next talk in this room, Roman's talk, which is like a deeper dive into the same kind of thing. Thank you very much.